Hey everybody, Eric Grenier here and welcome to the 128th episode of The Writ Podcast. It's a big by-election happening on Monday in Toronto, St. Paul. So I invited Dave Coletto, Chair and CEO of Abacus Data, to come back on the show for another data deep dive on where things stand in federal politics. David, it's good to see you. Good to see you, Eric. Thanks for having me. So I do want to get into the by-election. Now, I know you wouldn't... Uh, poll a riding you wouldn't dare do that right that's just too dangerous we'll see if anybody uh even dares to put out some numbers over this last weekend i i'm i'm not sure if anybody will try but the by-election last time it was a normal victory for the liberals safe riding carolyn bennett won by 24 points over the conservatives but we're talking a lot about whether toronto is going to stay red it's been wall-to-wall liberal over the last three federal elections, if the Liberals lost this by-election, it would be the first time they've lost in Toronto under Justin Trudeau. They got 52% of the vote in the last election. I asked you to get, uh, to kind of pull together your data so that we could do a little bit of a dive into Toronto. So what, what are we going to be using here? Yeah, so I pulled together four surveys that we did, national surveys from April to the most recent one that uh, completed in June, middle, middle of June. And so we've got a full data set of over 10,000 cases nationally. And that gives us the ability at the national level to, to dig really deep. But it also means we've got um, over a thousand cases in in Metro Toronto, so 416 Toronto. Um, I think we have 1,300. So even that is a pretty good uh, sample size for us to get a sense of what's happening in in the city. Okay. So what is happening in Toronto? Well, it's like other parts of the country. Um, you know, the Liberal vote is down substantially. Um, we've got the Conservatives right now in Toronto at 44, uh, the Liberals at 30, and the NDP at 17, the Greens at 5, and the People's Party at 4. So, um, you know, 52% was what the Liberals had in the last election. Um, they're down 20 points, and um, that's reflective, I think, of even more than what we've seen in other parts of the country, right? A bigger swing away from them. Um, and and it's hard for me to say is that, you know, obviously Toronto St. Paul's, for example, is is more closer to downtown in that old city of Toronto. Um, I would say the Liberal vote probably is doing better there uh, than it would be out in Etobicoke or Scarborough. But still, uh, this is a pretty big swing uh, for the Liberals in what used to be maybe Fortress Toronto. Yeah, with that kind of swing, this riding would be one to flip over. But as you said, it's not going to be uniform, right? The Conservatives probably have had more of their growth in, uh, you know, Ford Nation, Etobicoke, York, uh, places like that. So how much of it is going to be happening in this riding, uh, which is a really interesting riding in the context of Toronto, because as you said, it's it's in the old city, but it's midtown, so it's not quite downtown. It, it's a little bit... Um, uh, it's more wealthier riding. Uh, there's lots of university grads there. So it's not really a typical Toronto riding. But sticking to the Toronto-wide numbers, uh, you have looked around at where the vote has moved, who has lost, who has gained at the expense of which party. Yeah. So if we look at just first like loyalty, right, what percentage of their past voters are sticking with the three main parties? The Conservatives have held almost all of their past support. They've got 94% of previous supporters sticking with them. And that's reflective of what we've seen nationally or regionally as well. Uh, the New Democrats are holding about 82% of their previous support and the Liberals are, are actually down to only 69%. So they've lost about one in three of those who voted Liberal in, or say they voted Liberal in 2021, now say they're voting for another party. So that explains that big, that big swing. When we look at where that vote is moving, um, what's different in Toronto than in say other parts of the country is um, there's not as much NDP to conservative movement, right? Um, nationally, we see about one in 10 of those who voted NDP moving to the conservatives. In Toronto, it's only 5%, so much less. And that makes sense. The, the kind of voter that would cross what, what normally we think of this linear kind of spectrum mm. in British Columbia and in, in rural parts of the country, that's not the case. Northern Ontario even, I think, would be very different. We don't see that kind of movement. Um, we see some movement from the Liberals to the New Democrats. So the NDP have picked up some uh, disaffected Liberals. 8% of those who voted Liberal last time now say they're going to vote NDP. But the biggest swing are that Liberal Conservative switcher, right? 18% of past Liberal voters in Toronto now say they're going to vote, they would vote Conservative if, if an election were today. And that's, that's, think about it, one in five Liberal voters now are um, at least signaling to us that they would vote Conservative. 
So this is what would be really dangerous for the liberals in Toronto St. Paul's, right? Because there isn't a big core of NDP vote for the conservatives to take from. Um, it's instead going to be whether it's liberals going over to the conservatives, liberals staying home. Um, is there? Have we seen from the polling in Toronto? Are there particular issues that Torontonians are more concerned with that could drive this by election and you know the next election in Toronto as a whole more than other parts of the country? Yeah, I mean, if you look at the the top five issues, let's say, right, cost of living, housing, health care, the economy, and crime is tied with immigration. So that's six, but but crime and immigration are are tied. Climate change falls down to seven in Toronto. If you compare those in terms of the the, the actual percentage of people citing those as their top three, the things that over-index in Toronto right now are housing, which I don't think is surprising. Um, Housing's become a universal issue nationally, but it's even still more concentrated in the city of Toronto. And then crime, um, 11 points higher in Toronto than in the rest of the country. And so um, it's not universal. Not everybody's citing crime as an issue, but one in four voters in the city are saying it's one of their top three issues. And that's different uh, from other parts of the country. Where we see things lower, cost of living is slightly lower. It's still the top issue, but it's eight points lower than the national average. And healthcare is eight points lower, right? And so just to keep in mind, our question forces people to pick three. So it's not to say that cost of living or healthcare aren't necessarily important issues in Toronto. It's just that when you're forced to choose, you're much more likely to choose uh, crime and and housing um, if you live in the city than than some of the other issues right now. Does this suggest that one party is is kind of boosted by these issues? Because uh, I know you've also done some polling separately on, on which parties are seen as the best to handle the various issues for the people who think those are the important issues. So if we're looking at this in the context of Toronto, not specifically Toronto St. Paul's, but Toronto as a whole, does the issue set benefit one party more than another? Well, yeah, I think it benefits the Conservatives more. On, on the issue of crime, for example, if you pick that as a top issue, you are you're almost, you know, 80% chance you're going to vote conservative. That is a conservative issue that's being signaled by those right now who say they'd vote conservative. Housing, you think would be an issue that the Liberals should be able to compete on because the last budget and so much of the last year coming out of the federal government is focused on that issue. But uh, nationally, they're they're third uh, when you ask people which party do you think would be best able to handle that issue. So that's another issue that benefits uh, the Conservatives certainly more um, than than the Liberals, right? If you're the Liberals, you actually would have much rather have people say climate change or health care was a top issue in Toronto than than the ones that, that they are, because those are the issues where either the Liberals remain competitive with the other parties, or in the case of climate change, have a massive advantage over the Conservatives. And so the fact that climate change is down in seventh at only 20%, um, I think, gives us some insight into the kind of wedges and, and conversations that are likely happening at the doorsteps in, in Toronto St. Paul's. And this doesn't include some local issues, given the, the certain populations that, that live in that, that riding, uh, mainly you know, the, the larger Jewish population and the whole issue of the Middle East um, playing into uh, voter, voter behavior. Yeah, that's, uh, that's about 15% in the, the last census. Um, of, of residents in Toronto St. Paul's said they were Jewish in terms of religious. It could be a bit higher in terms of uh, identity. And uh, that's going to be one of those really interesting dynamics to see out on election on by-election night. Whether turnout, because you'd have the idea that turnout might be a little bit depressed among liberals, a little bit more enthusiastic among conservatives, and among um, you know Jewish residents in the riding, it might be one issue that might actually get people out to go and vote on a June 24th, nice uh, summer uh, day in Toronto. Don't have any uh, numbers on um, how you know the Jewish community feels, but one of the things that makes Toronto St. Paul's a little bit different, and I already kind of mentioned it, is the amount of university graduates. Okay. So it's 57% in the riding say they have a bachelor's degree or higher. It's only 41% in Toronto as a whole, so it's a it's pretty well-educated riding. Traditionally, if you were a liberal, you would think, well, that probably advantages us if this is a riding. We tend to, uh, with a lot of university grads, we historically, the liberals would say, have done well among university graduates. But the numbers don't really suggest that that would benefit them in Toronto. It's not. And, and it's interesting, you know, uh, just in terms of, of university educated uh, residents in Toronto, the conservatives are ahead by 14, 44, 30, with the NDP at 19. That more or less matches 
the, the citywide numbers among all respondents. So there's no real difference. Uh, education is not a variable, which is interesting because to your point, it has been for a number of elections and a number of years now, we, we've seen that education is a predictor of, of how people might vote. Um, we see it in the United States. You, you've seen it elsewhere. That seems to have, at least for now, uh, disappeared. Um, and I think it's in part because of how wide and large the conservative lead is that it's basically engulfed all demographics and all socioeconomic backgrounds. But in a riding like Toronto St. Paul, I think one of the reasons why the Liberals have been able to sustain that riding and, and win by such large margins, not separating the fact that you had an incumbent there for a long time and, and Dr. Bennett, I think, was a well-known and that probably gave the Liberals a boost there. But they held that riding in 2011, right, when, when they only won, I think, 11 seats across the whole province. Um, I think so. Um, that's probably because they were able to, to maintain some support among that particular demographic. And so right now we're not seeing that. And that's why this riding, I think, is in play, um, is because they aren't holding on to some of those traditional groups that, that liberals, uh, liberal party has been able to rely on um, consistently, even at the worst of times. It's been, an era, it's been a group that's at least hung on and supported the liberals despite others shifting away. Now, I'm not going to ask you for a prediction, uh, but, you know, when you're looking at these kinds of numbers, uh, province-wide, in Toronto, um, popularity of Justin Trudeau versus Pierre Poilievre, all that, those kinds of factors, we've heard that Liberals seem to be nervous about the by-election. The Conservatives do seem to be trying to downplay expectations, maybe just in case. Uh, they don't want to uh, discourage their own voters from coming out. What's your sense of what to expect out of the by-election the fact that we're talking about it at all, does that make sense based on the numbers we've seen? Well, I, I mean, I want, before I give my assessment, I also go back to the Durham by-election, right? Mm. And what we know from that by-election is the results of that one did mirror, um, except for the New Democrat vote, which was depressed, uh, did mirror what we would have expected to see if the, the, the regional and national polls were right. And so if I look at these numbers and, and the numbers that other pollsters are putting out, my conclusion is that if voters in that riding, regardless of the local issues and the dynamics and the things we can't measure, how good is the campaign, you know, are they, do they have a good turnout machine, that the Conservatives um, should be competitive, right, in a riding that they shouldn't normally be competitive. But because of how large their lead is in Ontario and in Toronto uh, and nationally, that I do expect on Monday night to be watching a, a pretty close race, right, one that we haven't seen before. Is it enough that the Conservatives can pull off a victory? I, I don't know, right? Um, we do MRP. I, I did a model a few months ago with some data that was not different from where we are today. Right? The, the polls have actually been pretty static since January. And so when I go back and I look at that model and I, and I look at St. Paul's, we have the Liberals ahead by four, 38, 34 with the NDP at 20. Now, I think that NDP number is probably too high. It, again, MRP doesn't take into account the fact that maybe the NDP is not putting resources into the riding or the candidate's not very good or the dynamics don't allow for um, or there's some tactical voting that might be going on. But that model does suggest that under the current circumstances, this is a very tight race. And that means that I wouldn't be surprised if the Conservatives win the riding. Um, and I would be surprised, actually, if the Liberals win by 10 points or more. I think that would be a signal that they've somehow found a way to overcome um, what is a very you know, bad kind of move in, in public sentiment against the Liberals, they've been able to hold that back. And if they pull that off, um, there's, there's a lot of lessons there. Like what did they do in Toronto St. Paul that allowed them to, do, to perform better than they would otherwise should be able to do right now? The NEP number is an interesting one because they have lost support in every by-election that's taken place in this parliament. So there's an expectation that with them being in a, th a third place position in this riding to begin with, that a lot of their voters might not bother to come out. So if their number ends up being not the 20 that you, you know that, that the model would give, and I would do the same thing because the NDP's number in Ontario is held up, but yeah. it's instead 10, but it's only because those people didn't go out to vote, it wouldn't really benefit one party or the other. It would just boost both of their numbers. So it, that will be something that will be interesting to see if the NDP numbers vote is down. Is it because they're just staying home? Or do some of them do go over to the Liberals to block the Conservatives? If, if the Liberals yeah. outperform, I think that would probably be what was going on. 
Yeah, and, and it's hard to say because in a by-election, the, the, the stakes aren't as high, right? Like this yeah. is not going to determine the outcome of, of, uh, of which party forms government. It's, it's, it may determine whether the prime minister stays or not, which um, is how it's being framed in the media. And, and, and so the stakes are being raised for voters in that sense. But if you're a New Democrat who doesn't like Justin Trudeau, um, maybe you stay home, maybe you vote conservative. Who knows? Like we don't know the dynamics of how that might play itself out if if that's the ballot question on people's minds, like this is my chance to send Justin Trudeau a message, then then we could see some weird behaviors that that our national polls can't pick up because it's such a local dynamic. If the Liberals lose this riding or it's very close, there could be a message to Justin Trudeau or particularly to some people who are upset in his caucus that he might have to consider stepping aside. So I wanted to get a little bit of an idea of how Trudeau's own numbers uh, have shifted over the last little while. Who is sticking with him still if, if uh, you know, there's any groups that are and versus who have left him uh, over the last uh, little bit. So who has he lost over the last uh, over the last year or so? What I did is I went back to uh, not a similar period, but a, a period of time in 2000. 21 and 22. So we've got about three months of data, a similar size data set. And I said, okay, we'll use that snapshot and we'll compare it to the, the April to June data and then see, okay, is there any group that has moved more in terms of more? And it's all negative, right? Like what we know from the, the national number is that the prime minister's negatives have, have considerably increased since the last uh, election, right? At the last federal election, right before the election, about equal numbers of Canadians had a positive and negative view of the prime minister. Today, it's in our polling, I think it, the last number was 28, 58. So, you know, minus 30, minus 33, I think it was. So when we dig deep and we look at, okay, is there one group in particular that have moved the most? The answer is not really. We've seen a, a pretty uh, consistent spread. So if you look at age, for example, um, 18 to 29 year olds, uh, the negative went from minus 10 to minus 31. So that's a significant um, move into the negatives. For the 30 to 44 year olds from minus 20 to minus 31. Uh, the middle age 45 to 59, minus 18 to minus 40. Um, the smallest swing interestingly has been among seniors. Those over 60, it was minus 16, you know, three or uh, two years ago, it's minus 28 today. So uh, what we're seeing from a demographic perspective is is younger Canadians um, have soured more on the prime minister than than older Canadians generally speaking and we also see that uh, women have also been more likely to, 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 to become more negative so they were minus 12 uh, in the first period and now they're minus 30 men are still more likely to have a negative view of the prime minister but the swing hasn't been uh, as great similarly um, we talked about education Back in uh, 2022, um, the Prime Minister's net favorable among university-educated Canadians was minus 7. It's not bad for, for an incumbent. It's now minus 22. Um, so again, a, a pretty uniform swing across the different education levels, but he started off in a better place among university-educated, and it's become um, uh, more worse. Interestingly, um, the dynamic between whether someone was born in Canada or is, is an immigrant is interesting. So. Uh, back in 2022, those born in Canada, the Prime Minister's net favorables was minus 22. So not that great to start. It's now minus 35. Among those uh, who are immigrants to Canada, it was plus 3. Uh, back in 2022, it's now minus 21. So again, another big swing uh, to, to the negative. And, and that replicates itself uh, across other demographic groups. But what's really interesting, last point I'll make, Eric, is among the self-identified kind of spectrum. We ask people, you know, do you place yourself on the left, center left, which is not a perfect way because a lot of people don't know what left or right means, but people who are right know what it means and people who are left wing, I think know what it means. Um, he wasn't liked back then among those on the right. They be, they've become even more uh, unhappy with, with the prime minister. Um, those on the left have also shifted, although not as much. So um, he was plus 19 for those who self-identified as on the left two years ago, it's now plus three. So he's still in the positive. Uh, center left, we've seen a, a, only a, an eight point swing, plus 13 to plus five. But the most, almost half of Canadians put themselves in the center of the spectrum. And he's gone from minus 20 to minus 34. And that I think is, is really very much the story of, 
of Canadian politics over the last two years is that he's really lost the so-called center, and and they've really turned against him. So big picture is not one group ha has kind of hung on to, um, and, and said, I really like this guy, I'm going to stick with him. We've seen a pretty uniform swing across demographic and, and political groups. That suggests to me that that is more problematic than if he had lost support more steeply among a particular group, but kept it among another. If if the by-election goes badly, or if even if it goes okay, but he decides later on in the summer that maybe it's time to, to step away, it doesn't sound like there will be a particular group of Canadians that will be upset about that. Um, no. Um, <laughs> even, I would say, a quarter of those who voted Liberal would be happy if he if he stepped away right now. And, and, and Ipsos was out this week with a poll that showed, you know, 68% of Canadians want the Prime Minister to step down. That hasn't changed, but it's still quite a number of, of even Liberals are saying mm -hmm. that maybe it's time for him to go. So, uh, I mean, one of the things that I always note, and, and we, we sometimes um, don't talk about because pollsters, we often combine the very positive and positive numbers in our favorabilities, is uh, the Prime Minister right now has only about 6 or 7% of Canadians who say they have a very positive view of him. Right? These are the the true believers. They, they like the Prime Minister. They, they're the ones on Twitter who yell at me when I put out a poll saying, you know, I don't know who you're polling. This guy's the best. Look at, all, look at everything he's done. On the flip side, though, you've got 40% of Canadians who say they have a very negative view of Justin Trudeau. Um, so almost five times more. And when I went back and I looked at a year before the last, sorry, the year before the 2015 election, and I wanted to look at what was Stephen Harper's numbers like, right, around the same time. Because if we remember, that was a change election. People were sick and tired of him. But our polling, anyways, did not single, signal the same kind of animosity that existed towards Mr. Harper than does to Mr. Trudeau. At the time, only 18% of Canadians had a very negative view of Mr. Harper. Not a lot liked him. Only 10% had a very positive. But more people were in the, ah, he's okay, or ah, I, you know, I'm not really a fan anymore. Trudeau is, is not... I wouldn't say he's polarizing because there's not a lot of people on the very positive side, right. but he certainly has a lot of distractors, which if we talk about a by-election, for example, those 40% who really don't like him, they're motivated, right? Um, and, and they're much more likely to come out and vote, and there's way more of them than those who say, I'm going to go out and defend this guy and protect him, and I want him to stay. Uh, it makes me think of... of um what uh, the prime minister said on, on power and politics earlier this week, um, you know, saying that Canadians aren't in a decision mode yet, but it feels like a lot of Canadians have made up their minds and there might not be that many more that are sitting on the fence that are able to go over to the liberals, able to decide that they can vote for Justin Trudeau in the end. It will come down to a choice in the next election. You know, elections are always about a choice. You have to choose one option over another. But are there really that many indicators that the decision, when it is finally made for good, could go in his favor? Well, first off, it is a choice, but you also have a third choice, which is not to vote at all. Mm. And we saw that in the Ontario election, for example, where a lot of voters decided none of these leaders or the stakes weren't high or there was no reason for me to get out and vote. And we've seen federally voter turnout start to come back down. So that's something to think about. Um, but I also think that I do think a lot of most Canadians have made up their mind about Justin Trudeau. Um, again, you, you can argue, or the Liberals have argued, some Liberals have argued, that we've come back in the past. We've been behind. Um, even when they use the, the 2015 election, we were in third. Well, that was a completely different scenario. It was like, you can't make, you cannot compare them. And I've even tried to go back and look in history, and you're probably better at this than I am, finding an incumbent government that was 20 points behind, just 20 points, regardless of whether they came back or what. It's very hard to find any government that is that unpopular at any point uh, in their mandate. And then to find one that's been able to come back from that, there's maybe a handful, right, that we can point to. And the circumstances are different. They've changed leaders, or they weren't eight or nine years into their mandate in the case of Mulroney. In, in the 88 election. Um, so I think, I think that there is still a, a chance that if Justin Trudeau is the le leader of the Liberal Party and Canadians are given a choice between him and Mr. Poiliev, that they can be convinced to vote Liberal. 
but the odds of that, you, you do the probabilities with your modeling all the time, the odds of that happening to me seem very low. And that the more likely outcome is conservatives who are deeply motivated to get rid of Justin Trudeau show up. And a lot of those who might otherwise vote liberal, unless the stakes are raised, right? And that uh, people feel as negative, like imagine there's two pieces of an electorate. Um, you basically need to have a scenario in which half the electorate um, is, is either scared or deeply unhappy with Mr. Polyev, and the other half is deeply unhappy with Mr. Trudeau, and that is what's motivating them. to. So it's basically negative uh, motivation is what's driving turnout, not a positive kind of, I want to vote for change. Um, but there's no evidence yet that the Liberals have been able to do that to Mr. Polyev because he's still the only leader in our polling that has a net favorable, uh, positive net favorable. Um, slightly, but still, we haven't seen his negatives rise all that much in the last six months. So it's going to take a lot of money, I think, and a lot of work to do it. And I'm left wondering if people aren't instinctively listening to Justin Trudeau, if they don't trust him, and he's out there litigating the case against Mr. Polyev, will he be able to convince people? Is he even persuasive anymore? And given how hard a, ch a time they've had to convince people that their changes at capital gains are are good or the budget is is going to make life better. They haven't been able to litigate that. Um, I'm not sure they can litigate um, the case against Mr. Polyev. And so it's really up to Mr. Polyev um, to determine whether he can just kind of coast and win the next election or whether he makes a mistake and hurts himself more than Mr. Trudeau can hurt him. It, the context is very different from the other times that uh, they might have pointed to to coming back. You, you mentioned 2015 being in third place. That was like for a couple of months because at the beginning of 2015, they were still largely in first place. 2019, yep. it was the SNC-Lavalin uh, affair that just broke, so their numbers tanked just for a few months. And then in 2021, they actually had a lead uh, that was pretty big, and they and they lost it. So the context between now and the previous elections, what they might look at as examples, are very, very different, right? And and you've taken a look as well at, at where the party has stood this far out from elections in the past. It's no surprise to anybody, but they're in a much worse position right now than they were 16 months out from elections in 2015, 2019, 2021. Yeah, and I say let's, let's put aside vote intention and just look at some of the other underlying numbers, right? Um, net approval for the government. Um, right now, it's minus 34 for the Trudeau government. Uh, a year bef uh, 16 months, sorry, before the 2020 election. Now, COVID, so that was not a very fair comparison because there was that rallying around the flag. The Trudeau government had a plus 21. Um, 16 months before the 2019 election, it was plus two, not bad. Um, and they barely won that election. It was an even vote, um, conservatives won more votes in that one. And then if you go back, I think the 2015 election is actually the most interesting because we remember that election as being like Harper could not win that election. It was over. There was a de desire for change and it was, you know, which change would people want? But 16 months out from that 2015 election, Mr. Harper's government had a minus two approval. Um, so minus two versus minus 34. And, and Harper then said, oh, I can go and I can win this next election. Um, he was facing very different uh, a public opinion environment. Same is true in how they felt about the leaders, um, Mr. Harper only had a minus nine when he was looking uh, 16 months out from an election. Mr. Trudeau's minus 33. And perhaps most important is the conservative, what I, you know, we look at accessible voter pools, those who say they're still open to voting liberal or conservative. Today, the liberals are at 39. Uh, back 16 months before the 2015 election, Mr. Harper and the conservatives were at 40, uh, sorry, 48. So still substantially larger number of people saying, I'm still open to voting uh, conservative, even if and in, at this moment, the conservatives and liberals were tied in our, in our vote intention with the NDP actually doing quite well. It was, it was that moment when the three parties were kind of coming together um, and, and, and Mr. Trudeau's leadership was starting to pull the liberals ahead. So, so again, I, I look at these numbers today and I say, this is unique, this is extraordinary, this is nothing like the liberals have faced. And it's certainly nothing like Mr. Harper faced in 20, leading into the 2015 election. And, and I will say, you look at the, the trackers after that snapshot in 2014, they did not get better for Mr. Harper. They got worse, right? And as people got closer to that decision point, they increasingly came to the conclusion that they wanted a change in government. So I don't know uh, how you convince people that uh, they no longer need that change they want 
um, unless you make that other alternative just so much worse, which I'm not how you, I don't know how you do that given how poorly Mr. Trudeau's numbers are. In 2015, the question was whether one of the alternatives would get all of that vote. It's clear right now that there is one alternative that is getting enough of the non-Trudeau vote to win an election. So there's even that question that's not even on the... Harper thought he could win in 2015 in part because the Liberals and the NDP have for a long time in that campaign were actually splitting the vote perfectly. It was a Doug Ford kind of situation for Stephen Harper. Uh, but Justin Trudeau doesn't have two parties to his right that are splitting the vote, uh, and, unlike, and, say, you know, David Eby out in B.C. Yeah, and, and maybe also instructive is when you ask people, who do you think is going to win the next election? 16 months out, they say, you know, almost half of people are now saying the Conservatives. So there's even this, you know, um, this, this conclusion coming to people's heads that it's done, like it's already finished. And... I, 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 you know, the Prime Minister going out and, and speaking to Canadians and, and, and trying to show that he's still in this and he's got the, the energy and he's going to fight it out, I think is an, an effect to try to change that perception. But it, it hasn't worked. Uh, Canadians are just as likely today to think that the Conservatives are going to win as they were uh, six months ago. And, and so this session of Parliament did nothing to reverse that, that expectation. Well, if we're in uh, somewhat unprecedented times, then uh, the Toronto-St. Paul's by-election could prove to be a surprise then. Whether it'll refute or confirm uh, these kinds of things, I guess we'll chat about that uh, in the months to come. David, really appreciate you joining me and uh, looking forward to the next time we can uh, dive into the numbers. Me too. Thanks, Derek. Take care.